Okay. Hey, Richard Howard here with the Government Sales Momentum Podcast. Today, we have Chelsea Maggett, CEO of Collaborative Compositions. Hey, Chelsea, how are you? I'm good. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Well, hey, uh, Chelsea, uh, just a little background as to you know why we're doing the podcast. I've seen you extremely active on LinkedIn and helping a lot of clients, especially small businesses, sell to the government. I know that's a passion of mine, uh, both from the government side when I was in the DOD and now as a uh, consultant. And whenever I see someone really doing a lot of good work, both with small businesses and for the government agencies providing value, I love to get them on the show and talk about you know what they're doing and kind of what their niche is. So thanks again for showing up today. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Perfect. Well, maybe if you could give a little uh, background on, you know, how you got into the federal marketplace, you know, and then maybe a little bit about your company now and how you're helping small and medium-sized businesses. Sure. So, uh, well, I've got the uh, typical, you know, evolutionary tale of a career here. And I say I was born into federal contracting. Well, most people weren't actually born into it. My parents started the company, uh, a woman-owned small business in my house when I was eight. Oh. So I was pretty much raised in it uh, and was speaking acronyms since I could talk, essentially. Uh, my folks were federal contractors on the, you know, the big contractor side, Raytheon, mm -hmm. Northrop, Lockheed. Um, so they had that that really substantial experience there that that really allowed them to to succeed in that that federal marketplace when they started their own company. Right. And right. so they actually started a woman owned small business with my mother uh, being the woman behind the woman owned small business. Mm -hmm. And uh, they won their first contract at the kitchen table for thirteen million dollars. So. Awesome. Yeah, it was a, a pretty interesting uh, start to my days since then. It was like, don't come upstairs in pajamas. This is an office now. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it's actually given me quite a lot of excellent experience in all facets of, of small business uh, government contracting from the administrative side all the way through contracts management, finance management, all the way through okay, how do you actually run and start a, a small business at, and get the, get involved with federal contracting? Yeah, no, that's, uh, it, it's interesting that you bring that up, that you were born into it, because I know on our side, you know, if I talk about, if I start talking, you know, federal contracting, DOD, any of that, any of that stuff, it turns into acronym city, right? And I know my wife and my family outside cringe when, you know, me and, you know, either a counterpart in the federal marketplace or, you know, a former military uh pal, just start getting into it because it's almost indecipherable unless you've been hearing it for a while. So the fact that you were raised in it, I think gives you a distinct advantage over a lot of people and, you know, probably a lot of the small businesses you help that are just getting into it and are overwhelmed with all of the information out there and the different language and the FAR and everything else. Oh gosh, their eyes really glaze over if they don't know what you're talking about. And it's, it's sometimes, I mean, that's half the battle is really understanding what it is that they're saying just to figure yeah. out, okay, do I want to get involved? Sure. Just to start. Yeah. I mean, when you look at how much money the federal government spends each year, and then you compare that to how few businesses actually even try or attempt to sell to the government, um, they really, it really is disproportionate. And um, it, it can be pretty intimidating for a small business or a, any business, frankly, uh, to jump into that space and to try to start understanding it. So I think what you're doing is is really positive, both for the government and for the companies you're trying to help. Um, now, what made you decide to get into this business? You were born into it. Your your parents did it. Your mom owned the, uh, the business, kind of working with the government. And But something must have resonated with you that uh, kind of brought you into this. Yeah, so I actually uh, worked with their company for a lot of my career and actually helped them sell that business uh, and was able to go get my MBA hmm. and actually learn a lot of the actual commercial side of business as well throughout my career there. And it, it really, I started my business during the pandemic in, in the throes of things, June of 2020. <laughs> and the motivation was, you know, I, I really saw all of these small businesses that, that were so intimidated by the, the just mass of information and perceived barriers to entry in the government market that were failing because the, the commercial market wasn't there anymore. And sure. it just, it, it immediately, all of their customer base <laughs> fell away. And just, I mean, just like you said, the government is a 
real big customer sure, <laughs> and sure. uh, the most reliable and, and probably the most sustainable customer. And they bought more during the pandemic than they bought pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. So for small businesses to, to fail in, in the throes of it, when they've got the opportunity to, to really succeed in government contracting with, you know, just given a little bit of understanding, that's really where I saw the need. Gotcha. Yeah, no, a lot of companies were looking to pivot, especially during the beginning of COVID. And it makes sense. I mean, you know, the government is a completely new customer base. And I know a lot of companies that have started off with by maintaining their commercial customer base, and now introducing the federal uh, customer base and kind of moving forward that way. Some, once they get the ball rolling, just completely pivot to the federal marketplace once they really understand that system. And I think, you know, with a little bit of focus and, you know, understanding, uh, a lot of these businesses, both small and, you know, larger, can do really well. And you have some really interesting niches. Um, You know, we've obviously talked before we got onto the podcast here. But maybe if you could tell us a little bit about uh, some of the uh, more non-traditional ways that you like to help your clients in the federal marketplace. Uh, specifically, we talked about other transaction authority. Um, you know, if you want to start with that, that would be great. Sure. So basically, you know, having grown up in this federal ecosystem, I, I grew up with the folks saying the government's the government, the government doesn't change. And, and about five, eh, maybe five, six years ago, I, I really saw some, some changes starting to, to sprout. And it was, it was really some, some innovation that I, I was starting to see people say, what if we don't use the FAR? And what if we go outside of the FAR, which is the federal acquisition regulation? And, and so if, if we go outside of that, do we have options? And, and what are those options? And, and are they you know, more easily accessible to us? So OTAs, uh, other transaction authorities, uh, are actually one of those non-FAR uh, acquisition methods that's that's really sort of found a, a place near and dear to my heart because it it just really is so unique in in what it offers both the the participants and the government. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, in, and I think I told you before, I actually haven't spent too much time focusing on OTAs in you know whether we're doing podcasts or marketing or just talking with our clients. One thing that I I do have some experience with is broad area announcements, and that is uh, certainly um, part of the OTA. And I also want to mention while it's on my mind, you have a great slide deck that you put together um, that talks specifically to OTAs, which you have agreed to make available to anyone listening. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to to receive that, certainly reach out to us and I'm going to put everything in the show notes so you can contact um, uh, both Chelsea and myself, either of us can send you that. And that, that would be great. And I found it uh, very informative as well, just reading through that. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit uh, more about the specifics with OTAs. What part of that do you like to work with? Um, and then I could certainly tell you what my experience has been, especially using you know broad area announcements. Sure. So basically, uh, I probably should start out with, you know when people think other transaction authorities, We've probably all heard it's defined by what it's not, which is just absolutely not helpful for pretty <laughs> much anybody who's trying right. to figure out what they are. Mm-hmm. And in, in reality, it, it comes down to the word transaction. So if you think about it like as any other commercial transaction that you have, you know, you're buying a car, uh, that's not necessarily, you're not going into a, a long-term contractual agreement with your car dealer. You're just going to buy a car. So you go, you get the car you want, you pick out everything you want to add it on and and that's the transaction. You drive off a lot and there you go. Right. So it, it's simple in that term. And, and that's where I like to, to make sure people are sort of aware of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, it isn't a contract. It's, it's not a FAR-based contract. Right. And that's really why I like it. So typically the FAR is, it's a very long burden, like it's burdensome process. And it, it takes a lot of overhead funding. It takes a lot of effort. It takes absolutely clean understanding uh, of what it is the requirement is, what the customer actually wants. And it it, it just takes so long to get anything done. I mean, if we've got lead times of two years, well, what are we going to do? I mean, it's just, and no small business can work on a lead time of two years. It's just not, that's not right. Right. So these OTAs that are the other transaction authority was, was actually sort of broadened through DOD uh, I think in 2015, and it it really has allowed DOD to to take this concept and and run with it. 
Um, the most frequent way I'm seeing that done is via consortiums. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting you point that out. Uh, we do have, uh, I have a few clients right now interested in, you know, and this is what, 2021, beginning of September that we're recording this. So the Advanced Battle Management System program has a just released basically a consortium to, um, or consortia, I never know how to pronounce that, but basically bringing some companies together to dictate, you know, and help the government with how they're going to go through the process. It is something we're seeing more and more. Um, maybe you could describe maybe how you've used that in the past and why you think it's beneficial. Sure. So I think traditionally the government is, and, and, you know, it's not, I don't think to any fault of their own, more to the fault of the bar, they're inaccessible. Uh, and so getting to talk to the government customer throughout the process of the acquisition is, is not something that FAR really allows for at all. And uh, so it's kind of been trained throughout the acquisition workforce. Now, there is essentially unlimited access via a consortium. And when, when I say that, uh, the way that consortiums work is, is the government will solicit uh, a requirement for a consortium management firm. And that firm is the intermediary between the government and the consortium members. So the companies that are, are members in that consor consortium. Now that gives a financial incentive to an intermediary to force the government to interact with you. It's which, just- yes, it, which, it, which is different. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hugely different. It's It's mm -hmm. entirely legal. It's all allowable and it's all throughout the process. I mean, there's really no period where they say, Okay, so sorry, you can't you can't talk to your customer anymore. Uh, no more communication, right. and it, you know it's it's unlimited throughout the process. So so that's really where I found there's there's a ton of benefit is is the access that you are able to get and the, the conversations that you're you're really able to have with the customer. And I, I I really see requirements being shaped in a way like they I feel were back in the '90s and you know the big boom of the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And really starting to get some some customer input into some of these solutions that are being delivered. So when you're looking to help a customer in that way, are you looking for advertised consortium, uh, you know, ways to get into one on existing programs? Are you actually going out and finding a government customer and suggesting, hey, you might consider putting this together? What what have you, what would you suggest to somebody listening to this if they have a particular effort with the government or the DOD that they're interested in? You know, how would they either suggest a consortium or should they be looking for it already, you know, in, as far as like a RFP, RFI on SAM.gov, something along those lines? So uh, with the consortiums, the original solicitation is for the consortium. Uh, it's not for the companies that are looking to work on the opportunities that come through the consortium. So you wouldn't be finding the RFIs for the opportunities that come through the consortium on SAM.gov or on um, Seaport or any of these other MAC contracts that, that you might have or any of these portals that you might typically have access to. That's because most of these consortiums are, are run by uh, basically a, a pay to play uh, methodology. So I, uh, you know, there's a list of them. It's constantly growing. Um, Meter does a, a, a really great job of, of keeping that list up to date. Um, and, and I can provide a link to that. Yeah. And, and so basically they set up a consortium and it's, you know, approximately $500 uh, on annual. That's pretty much the average cost I've seen to be a member. And the consortiums are typically topic area focused or area focused, technical area focused. Mm -hmm. So when I've got clients that are, you know, for instance, I've, I've had a client that works in automation and robotics. Mm -hmm. Now, all the services have some sort of automation and robotics effort going on. And they actually, most of them have a robotics focused or a mobility focused uh, consortium. Right. already in existence and open to folks who, you know, have $500, which in the grand scheme of federal contracting overhead dollars is not a whole lot. That's, you know, open to you to join. Okay. So once you join that, you get access to all those opportunities that, that come through that uh, focused technical area. That is interesting. So your experience with these consortiums is 
that a lot of those opportunities aren't going to the sam.govs they're not going not getting sent to the gsa schedule holders they're only going to be available to the people within the consortium and who who comes up with those opportunities is that a you know, you mentioned one company kind of manages it for, you know, is almost a go between between the government and everybody that's in the consortium. Is this something that that company works with the, the federal stakeholders, the program manager, contracting officers, and they're feeding them different efforts? Or does the consortium have a say in kind of what the government is putting money towards? So the money, first of all, the money is all different colors and it comes from the government. So mm-hmm. it's not from the management firm, but it, it comes through the management firm who, you know, allocates it out. Um, the topic areas and the opportunities that come out are based on uh, problem statements. Now, I don't know if you've had a whole lot of experience with problem statements with the government, but some of them in the past haven't been quite clear. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe the problem wasn't necessarily defined adequately. Right. Uh, and, and so the, the consortium management firm really has a role in, in helping the government clarify and and really sort of break down and, and explain some of these problem statements further. Now, it's not that they're planting any seeds. They've got no dog in this fight. It, it's it's really that they are, are trying to help the government speak a more commercial sure. language. That, that makes a lot of sense. I know. Uh, just going back to, you know, on the Air Force side, when I was a program manager there, one of the big things we were challenged with is how do we grab kind of the best, the latest and greatest technology, the most innovative companies that are out there that don't work with the government? Because frankly, the big companies, although from time to time they come up with something great, a lot of the new, most innovative stuff resides with the startups and the smaller businesses out there. And they have, a lot of them had no idea or never even thought of working with the government. So, you know, there's obviously, as you know, there are a lot of programs out there to kind of grasp uh, or help those companies work with the government. This is one of them. And I think that's great. I mean, it really, anything we can do to help a company it shape some of that. And also, you know, in the government, A lot of the, I'll speak to the DOD because that's where I come from, you know, and what I tell my clients is, you know, your contracting officer is not the expert in automation. I'll use that since you brought up one of your clients, right? They're the expert at putting companies on contract for the government, right? The program manager, he might be an automation program manager, but he could have been a cybersecurity program manager last week. And he could have been buying hammers and nails the week before or flying airplanes, right? Because they make changes you know, very often. So a lot of times the government relies on the businesses out there to help them shape requirements. And that's what gets lost, I think, a lot of times when a company is trying to sell. They don't realize just how much influence they can have in requirements that come out on a solicitation. And this consortium is a great way to do that. I think that you have a really interesting niche and not many people focus on that. So um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you helped a client. I mean, you don't have to give the name or anything, but you know, in generalities as you can, like, you know, how would you help a client through that consortium model? Sure. So, you know, I, I would just like to use an opportunity uh, that I've worked with uh, out of consortium previously as, as uh, an example here. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an opportunity in which the government specifically asked, we, we've got sort of a general sense as to we've got problems, but we want you to tell us what you think they are and what you think your solutions are. And they called it an open season event. And okay. uh, I thought that was pretty, I thought it was entertaining. Uh, but basically they asked for businesses, uh, all businesses through this consortium to fill in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, 250 word max per uh, cell. It's like six cells with a ROM mm-hmm. uh, yeah, across. Not a lot. And you could submit as many ideas as you wanted. Uh, and those ideas were, were sorted through and, you know, some of them were accepted and others were put in a basket, which means they, they could be funded in any time in the next two years. Sure. And, and, and so the opportunity to really help shape those requirements really is there. Uh, so really in where I've, where I've helped my clients is, is understanding which, which, which consortiums you want to join. Um, you know, it's, duplicity in government is is all too common as you know and so i'm not going to be 
the first to say, let's go suggest more consortiums. Mm-hmm. Let's just first see and, you know, check if there's one that applies to what it is that, that you want to do or, or your line of business. And, and then we really look at, okay, how much money is like flowing through that consortium? And sure. most of them do a pretty good job of reporting awards and, and mm-hmm. funding. Um, they've, they've all got pretty good annual reports they, they give out and they all do uh, quarterly industry days. Um, and, and so it's really easy to get a good sense as to, okay, is this going to be worth my time? Is there a lot of activity happening uh, with this consortium or, or is it kind of, has it kind of been, you know, low, right. low activity over the past year or whatever? And, and then we really say, okay, let's join it. And what that means is basically filling out a membership form request and, and signing an agreement that says, you know, you're not going to breach this member consortium. Um, and, and so it's 250 prorated for, for half the year if you join late. So there, there's really no reason not to join these. Right. And, and, you know, join all that you, you feel that you might have a tie to because it's such a low cost of, of entry to, to join these things. And, and really then it's making sure you're utilizing the ecosystem that's provided by these consortium managers. They, they really do great portals. They have great, uh, you know, teaming resources, directories, um, and they really do a great job of, of facilitating communication between not only members, but members and government. So it's, it's really helpful to, to really get involved and, and it, it just really, it, you know, once you're in, it just kind of sucks you in. It's, it's the defense supply chain, you know? Sure. Yeah, no, that is, uh, that's half the battle. And that I'm sure that resonates with a lot of people listening. Cause one of the major questions I get from clients, even if they've been in this space for, you know, 10 or 15 years and, you know, whether they're struggling or, you know, they've been doing pretty good is, you know, how do I even create the relationships with the program managers? Like you said, it's, it's a lot of times you can't just knock on the door, right, of the person, of the program manager or contracting officer, because you can't even get onto the base, right? So how do you even create that? How do you even find the people that are making those decisions? And it sounds like your experience with the consortium is they actually help you with some of that, creating those communities, creating those events where you can go and meet probably not only other businesses that you can team with, but the decision makers, the requirement generators, maybe the program managers, contracting officers, depending on the consortium and the events that they're having. I think those are all extremely powerful ways for a company to create those relationships, which for me, my experience has been at the end of the day, a lot of government sales is a relationship game. And how do you, how do you create those up front? This is a great way to do it. Um, you also mentioned funding, which is, I just wanted to give a note, very important to ask that question is, is the effort that you're interested in, is it funded, right? So it usually starts with a requirement, then you can have all the requirements in the world, but if the funding isn't there to support that, then, you know, there's not going to be a contract that makes sense for the company. So it sounds like you can answer all of those questions with a good consortium. Absolutely. I would think that all of those could probably be addressed with, with one good consortium. Yeah, that is amazing. You know, uh, Chelsea Meggett, CEO of uh, Collaborative Compositions, you provided a ton of insight here as far as um, OTAs are concerned, and just, I think, in general, some of the things that you need to think about as a small business. I know that uh, a lot of people listening are going to be extremely interested in how to reach out to you. I'm going to put a bunch of links in the show notes so they can get to you. Is there anything that you wanted to uh, say before we leave? Any? Uh, did you want to direct them any place in particular or any uh, efforts that you have going on that you'd like everyone to know about? You know, I would just say there's bound to be an increase in OTA activity over the next year. And, uh, and now is really the time to start looking at, at where you want to put your eggs. So uh, yeah, just definitely reach out if you're interested. Awesome. Well, I agree. Also look out for that link that uh, Chelsea mentioned here as far as um, you know where you can see where some of these consortiums are. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you, Chelsea, for joining us and we'll see everyone on the next show. Thanks. Thanks so much.